As, as always, yes, as you, there's not a problem, my dear. Is this you? Oh, no, just sit there. That's fine. Let Elena sit here. Yeah, that's fine. Hi. Nice to meet you. Yeah, nice to meet you. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Peter, would you like to go there then? So good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. I'd welcome back. Could you please take your seats? So once again, good morning, everyone, and welcome back to the second day of this uh, conference. Um, we've got a, a very exciting and stimulating schedule for today as well. This first session will focus on the results, the first results of the OECD survey on the role of the Ombudsman institutions in open government. The survey or copies of it are on, on the table as well. Um, the second session uh, will be on current and future challenges for Ombudsman, also a very timely topic. Uh, and then in the afternoon, as you all know, there will be four working groups and then presentations of the findings of these working groups. So a full day of discussion ahead. Now, just a few words about this survey, which is, as I said, on your table. It was done in conjunction with the European Ombudsman Office and in close cooperation with the Association des Ombudsmen et Médiateurs de la Francophonie and the International Ombudsman Institute Networks. So what is the survey about? Well, we'll hear about it from uh, Elena Gentili from the OECD, who will present all the findings to you. Um, the survey is about looking at open government practices in ombudsman offices across Europe, and very interestingly, across Europe and beyond Europe. It's quite, quite fascinating reading, actually, if you start. Um, and the aim was to see what kind of policies are already in place and see how ombudsmen could further improve open governance in national administrations. So I'm going to give the floor now to Elena. Please come here to the lectern, Elena, and, uh, and uh, kick off. And you can sit here as well, but then take the, the microphone. Thank you. It's on? Yes. So thank you very much for having me today. Um, I'm very pleased to be uh, presenting the results of uh, uh, this very new and unprecedented study on the role of ombudsman offices in promoting open government principles. Um, we are also happy as the OECD to be really uh, today among uh, unusual institutions for us. Uh, we work uh, a lot with the executive, um, and, but uh, it, we realize more and more the importance of really working with more diverse institutions um, that are working to serve the public interest. 
Um, so before I start, I would like also to thank all the institutions who supported uh, this initiative. First of all, Ms. O'Reilly for her support, uh, but also for her um, courageous and innovative vision of, uh, towards uh, enhancing the role of the Ombudsman offices. Um, then I would like to thank um, the, uh, the Association of Francophone Ombudsmen and Mediators, the Association of Mediterranean Ombudsmen, and the International Ombudsman Institute for the support throughout the study. Uh, we also hope that uh, this is the beginning of, of a partnership that is meaningful and that will bring more and more knowledge and, and um, um, new results within our work. Before I start presenting the findings of the study, I'd like just to say a few words about... Oh, let me just... Yes. <laughs> Um, yes, this is the, just briefly the table of content uh, for, for, the, um, for the presentation today. So I will just say a few words about the work that the OECD does on open government. And then I will go and explain the findings of the survey, uh, which was tackling three different areas. Uh, the first area is the um, uh, open government perspective within the um, institution frameworks and architecture of the Ombudsman. The second one is uh, the open government culture within uh, what the Ombudsman offices do as, as uh, usual business. And the third one is the potential or, and actual engagement of the Ombudsman offices into public governance processes. So the, the OECD work on public gover um, um, open government is 15 years, 15 years old, more or less. Um, it has um, advanced to, um, to uh, uh, increase the, the assess and, and assessing the, the importance of this topic in different governments. Uh, as you see from these covers of these different publications, there is work that is done on a country base, so supporting specific countries in enhancing the open government agenda. But there is also comparative work, uh, putting together data from different countries and analyzing uh, best practices um, and results, as well as uh, remaining challenges. Um, the, the OECD also uh, used these uh, processes of reviews very much to uh, animate uh, policy dialogue among different stakeholders. And this is why our, our meeting today is very important, because um, it's important to discuss what comes out of our analysis and, and see together how we can draw a way forward. The OECD defines uh, open government as a culture of governance based on innovative and sustainable policies and practices and inspired by the principles of transparency, accountability and participation, which fosters democracy and inclusive growth. As you see here, there are some elements that are part of uh, the work that you do. It's innovation and sustainability, which is very important for developing good policies, and then there is the three main principles of open government, that is transparency, accountability, and participation, which is very much, as we will see today, part of your work. Um, when all these, uh, all public institutions in the executive, parliament, and judiciary um, work together with diverse parts of the society, uh, with the private sector, with civil society, with academia, with media, then uh, we come to a new concept, a bigger concept that is defined as open state. So now the OECD is really working towards expanding the idea of open government to the idea of open state, which is, uh, first of all, including all branches of power, but also diverse stakeholders inside society, and really making policy making a, a totally and fully inclusive process. Okay, so now uh, starting to present the findings of the, of the survey. Um, the first part uh, will look into 
who um, responded. So there was quite uh, um, an important um, constituency that responded to this survey. We reached out to 86 institutions and 59 countries and territories, uh, plus the European Ombudsman. Um, it is interesting that among the institutions who responded, they were both uh, working at the national, but also at the subnational level. Um, and then the supranational is, is basically the European Ombudsman. So now let's look into the characteristics of the Ombudsman institutions. We will talk here about their mandate um, and also about their core values. So in terms of the mandate, um, there is uh, some diversity. Um, most of the Ombudsman offices, uh, of course, they accept and deal with complaints against uh, public administration. Um, the, most of the organizations of the Ombudsman offices also work on mediation between citizens and administrations as part of their process of resolving the complaints. Um, there is a focus on access on, of information which is very important for transparency. Um, and there is also a big focus on the protection of human rights. Uh, and within this big family of protection of human rights, we have some specialization. Some ombudsman offices have a specialized mandate, for example, for protection of children's rights, for prevention of torture, um, then more generally anti-discrimination also in, uh, in countries where, for example, there is an anti-discrimination law, but also beyond that. Um, regarding access to information, this is a very important um, uh, principle of open government. 39% of the respondents said that they, yes, they uh, oversee the right to access to information. Um, of those that are not the official institution in charge, of, uh, so some of them have a clear mandate for that, some of them do not have but still receive complaints uh, and they transmit them to the competent authority. So there is also, um, this is uh, an additional uh, insight that comes actually from a different process that the OECD conducted and is the role of Ombudsman in gender equality. Um, uh, the OECD, um, as you may know, also works on gender equality in public life and this is part of our governance, uh, public governance uh, agenda. Um, so two surveys that were done in 2011 and in 2017 uh, in examining different aspects of gender equality in public life also looked into the role of the Ombudsman uh, for uh, monitoring the implementation of gender equality uh, laws or for addressing cases of gender, uh, gender discriminations. Um, for the 2011 uh, survey that uh, fed into a publication published in 2014 on women government and policy making, 55% of the responding countries, they declared that they do address cases of gender equality as well. Um, and then in the following survey that is now in the process of being, uh, of, uh, which replies are in the process of being looked at now, uh, some preliminary findings show that some countries, among which Portugal, Spain and Sweden, also have a specialized uh, ombudsman dealing with gender equality, which is uh, based in the parliament. Uh, some examples, I think there is some examples of how their mandate on gender equality is implemented, which we can uh, quickly go through, but they can also come back later on when we will talk about some of the best practices. I think there is a lot of diversity here. Um, some of just few issues that I'd like to uh, highlight is that, um, for example, the Greek Ombudsman uh, that has a mandate to also analyze cases that go uh, in areas where the anti-discrimination law does not apply, which is very interesting because it really uh, draw uh, an innovative area of intervention for the Ombudsman. And also um, in, in Finland we have uh, the Ombudsman office as a very active role 
uh, that goes much beyond uh, addressing complaints. Uh, and it goes in the areas of sensitization um, of, of different stakeholders on these issues um, and really um, looking into how to promote uh, better policies based on the input that they receive through the complaints. Uh, so what is the institutional encourage of the ombudsman, according to the findings? Um, so many of them are um, um, affiliated somehow to the parliament, um, and some of them are to the head of government or state. And then when it comes to uh, others, refrain to refers to supreme, supreme audit institution, a ministry, but also includes... Um, the institutions whose budget is included in the budget of the legislative body. So now we're going to look at what is the culture of ombudsman offices across the board and how does it um, refer and, and, and um, reinforce open government principles. First of all is open, a culture of openness. Uh, and transparency. So many ombudsman offices, they do adopt a code of conduct. Um, they also have uh, a practice of where staff, and in some cases only senior staff, in some cases all the staff of the ombudsman, have to um, uh, undertake a declaration of no conflict of interest. So public availability of the vision, the strategy, and the action plan. So most of the ombudsman offices declare that, uh, yes, their, their public vision, their vision and the strategy and the action plan, it is public. Um, some of them said that can be made available on request, or some of the 9% is not available. Uh, but I think here uh, the most important uh, finding is that 72%, which is a big, big percentage, declare that their, 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 their strategy and their action plan is, is made fully public. So they foster full transparency of what they do. Um, now, what about uh, pu making public uh, their investigations? Um, so here we see that 45% of uh, the respondents uh, said that, uh, yes, the investigations are public, but they are not case by case. They are made public in a report that is kind of summarizing, uh, the, for example, early work or the main issues that were addressed during uh, the, the past year. Um, yes, then we still have uh, a 22 percent that's also made public individual cases. Um, and then do we have um, the possibility of not being published at all, which is really uh, a minor percentage, it's only 6%. Communications of decisions and recommendations. So going again to the culture of openness, so what is our strategy, what is our purpose, how do we do it, what kind of issues we deal with, and then what kind of decisions we take, what kind of recommendations we make to stakeholders who are involved in the different cases. Um, here we have um, that recommendations and uh, decisions are quite widely made public, um, either through regular reports, to special reports, to specific stakeholders around specific issues. Um, um, uh, the, the findings are presented to parliament in parliamentary sessions. Um, and a lot, 90, and actually 85% of all institutions and 90% of institutions that belong to the international net, uh, the European network of ombudsmen are actually making this information public in, in the website, so accessible to the wider public. Also, there is an effort, uh, if you see in the smaller percentages, which is also relevant, uh, which is a more active network of uh, effort of promoting the, the decisions and recommendations, for example, through seminars on uh, specific issues. So 
there is two levels here that are highlighted. So it's, it's the main issues and the main recommendations that are made public to anyone who wants to access them, but there is also an active role of ombudsman offices in promoting those, those uh, results. Use of the social media. Of course, the social media is very important uh, today to, to communicate with different uh, constituencies, especially with the young generations. Um, and it's important also in the, in the vision of thinking that ombudsman offices who are serving citizens' rights are actually known and utilized by also young people. So the, their presence on social media is very important. Um, here you have that there is a good level of presence, especially through Facebook and Twitter. Um, but then, uh, for sure, there is space for improving information that are circulated through, through uh, social media and maybe also thinking of what kind of capacity uh, ombudsman offices should adopt to actually be able to be present. We know from the OECD that is actually an actual job to, to, to timely put information on the website, on, on the social media. So it, it requires time and also expertise to do that. So is that maybe something we want to think about of how we can improve it? Um, then we go to another um, key principle of open government, which is participation and engagement with external stakeholders. So how do the ombudsman offices engage with external stakeholders? There were a number of questions in the survey that analyze both who are the external stakeholders, so what is the level of diversity uh, of stakeholders that are consulted with, and then how the ombudsman offices work with these stakeholders. Um, so first of all, we'll look into who are the, what are the mechanisms, some of the mechanisms for consultation. Um, one of the mechanisms is public perception surveys. This is an important tool for, um, for ombudsman offices and for any institution to understand how public perceive us or perceive your institution, what kind of expectations there are, and whether we are uh, responding to expectations of our intended public. Um, here we have that basically half of the uh, consulted ombudsman offices do during the survey. Uh, they adopt this tool and, and a half don't. Um, here we have some, some examples of uh, countries that actually do adopt perception surveys uh, and they have developed good practices. Uh, for example, the Austrian Ombudsman Board, uh, in, they, they promoted an initiative which is called Ombudsman in the Eyes of the Public. And this, of course, as I said, seeks understanding of how the public perceive uh, and what kind of responsibility is the public also expecting the Ombudsman to, to respond to. Um, then we have also example from the UK, from the Ombudsman for Wales, uh, and from Lithuania on the use of this tool. Um, so here we, you can see a little bit more broadly who are the institutions that ombudsman offices work with. Um, so the general public, um, these are everyone, all the citizens uh, with the different needs. Um, then you have different kind of institutions. Um, of course, um, very prominent is academic experts. Then you have NGOs um, with different kind of specialization, whether it is working on uh, children's rights uh, or, or women organization or minority rights, uh, elderly rights. So a lot of, although it is very much broken down, uh, this graph in the middle, but you see that a lot of these categories actually are under the big family of human rights. Um, and then you have some also specialized, let's say, professional organizations. So, that, so this information suggests both uh, two main issues. First of all, ombudsman offices work with, um, with civil society and various organizations to acquire certain expertise that is needed to analyze certain issues more in, in a technical and professional manner, but also really uh, consulting on the broader human rights agenda and how uh, the different needs of different uh, constituencies can be addressed. Um, so what is, in, in the perspective of ombudsman offices, their 
uh, the objectives of participating, of engaging with, with external stakeholders. Um, so there is different objectives that are recognized here. 90% for sure is to promote the role of the ombudsman to make sure that everyone knows what you're doing and, and they actually can access your services and your support. But also we have high percentages, 77%, uh, in which um, so the ombudsman offices, they wish to increase access to the services. Uh, this is related to the first one. Um, strengthening, strengthening the implementation of ombudsman recommendations. Um, this is also uh, talking about somehow the beneficiary of your recommendations, so engaging with them in understanding what the recommendations are about and what can be done in practice to put them in, in to translate them into reality. Um, and then um, there is some, as I said, some uh, um, issues re related to increasing the ability to analyze and detect problems which can rely on the expertise of specific institutions. So here, let's say all these different objectives lead through three different ways of engaging with external stakeholders. So these are three main categories of engagement. One is, and it goes like in, in, in the sense of increasing engagement. So sharing information as a first level, basic level. Second level is consultation. And third level is actually collaboration and partnership. Unfortunately, or, or maybe, I mean, this is, this is an important finding to reflect on. We see that there is a, a regression from level one of just sharing information to the higher level of engagement, which is collaboration and partnership. And, and we, we think that would be great if we could actually reverse that, that trend and make uh, the, the, the last level of engagement, the stronger level of engagement, actually more relevant. Um, some country examples. Again, um, to make this discussion a little bit more concrete, uh, of course, all these findings come from all of your good practices and information that was shared uh, with the OECD. Uh, and you also have, I believe, in your briefings, uh, uh, something about good practices that, so that you can have some more information on them. Um, so sharing information, these examples are going in the direction of showing what some countries are doing under these three categories of engagement. Um, for example, the Austrian Ombudsman Board uh, is working with um, television programs. I mean, this is about, you know, spreading information about Ombudsman, what they are doing, what kind of engagement they have, what kind of uh, impact they can have. Then on the level of consultation, um, for example, um, we have um, the Bureau de Médiateur de la Wallonie, de la Fédération Wallonie-Bruxelles, that they have uh, regular meetings and consultation with public bodies, representative of students and professors of the Réseau Vallon de Lutte contre la Pauverté. So this is a way to um, somehow acquire information, but also um, um, strengthen the cooperation with certain constituency. Um, and then also the Scottish example where uh, the Ombudsman um, is liaising with the representative of customers and the local authority and the national health system. Again, with these two, uh, these two dimensions of acquiring information, but also uh, promoting partnership. And then uh, let's see some examples of, of what is actually happening when the Ombudsman offices, they engage um, strongly uh, in partnership with other institutions. Um, so we have an example from Ireland, um, engaged service provider with new service comes under the jurisdiction. Uh, so uh, trying to, um, um, to work with service providers to uh, make sure that the way they deliver services are actually meeting with, with the needs and expectations of the public. Um, and work with citizen information center that can receive complaints from the ombudsman. Uh, these are very important. Um, it's a very important cooperation because we know that through this cooperation with the citizen information centers, many complaints are actually channeled to the ombudsman. So it's a way to broaden uh, the ground for the ombudsman offices to reach the public. 
So what are some of the challenges uh, to promote an open government culture within uh, the institution? Um, many, many ombudsman offices reply that there is a lack of a comprehensive approach or strategy to implementing an open government principle, which is somehow in contradiction with what I just presented to you. And this is some of the interesting aspect of this survey. So I just talked a lot about the culture of openness and of participation, and you saw how much work you are already doing on this level. So uh, the fact that there is not um, a, a comprehensive approach or strategy, it's not really stopping ombudsman offices from actually engaging on basic uh, on the essential open government principles, which are transparency, participation, and, and, um, and accountability. But that there is um, some kind of discrepancy because, be, be, between the perspec internal perspective of the institutions and how they build their institutional culture and what they actually do. Um, then, of course, uh, in terms of top challenge, which you can see in the gray, this is the first top its lack of financial resources, and then which is also echoed in a lack of human resources, lack of expertise, so the lack of financial or human resources is a major challenge that is actually highlighted in, 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 in more than one column there, uh, to actually be able to fulfill better um, uh, ombudsman mandate vis-a-vis -vis open government principles. Um, here, uh, just um, so how can, can uh, ombudsman offices um, enhance the institutional capacity to work on open government? So we are now transitioning towards what they can, what ombudsman offices can, can more actively, more strategically do in terms of promoting this principle that are already part of their practice. Um, some, some institutions um, uh, work on internal training and sensitization, um, really helping their own staff to understand more precisely the principles that they are using throughout the work. Um, and then also um, some, we have some examples of Ombudsman Office, like the Ombudsman of for Wales, that actually adopted a strategy, a specific strategy on open government and participation. Um, so we are talking about different levels, starting with sensitization and more institutional awareness vis-a-vis -vis the commitment of ombudsman offices towards open government and then a more codified commitment which comes through um, a, a specific strategy. So now we are going to the last section of the, of the study, which is the one that is actually um, analyzing actual commitments and also potentials through looking at best practices uh, to engage more uh, systematically, more strategically on open government um, uh, principles. Here, uh, through this graph, you see that what are the top five contributions of the Ombudsman institutions to public governance. These are the replies. Uh, so there is a high feeling of contribution to improving accountability of the public sector. As you know, many of the complaints are citizens who have issues with the public administrations. So uh, somehow the responsibility and the active work of the Ombudsman highlights and strengthens accountability towards the public. Then there is improving transparency, and here we find again all the principles of open government uh, to the public, uh, improving public service delivery, so the quality of the services, um, increased citizen trust in public institution. Um, but then we see that if we, while we are degrading towards lower shares, um, there is also um, like more um, improving the efficiency of the public sector, which goes more on the level of public governance. And then we have improving citizen participation in policy making, which also looks at the quality of policy making, how they respond to citizen needs, uh, prevent and fight corruption, uh, improve transparency of the private sector. So you see here that there are some level of answers, which are not the majority, but are there and are an indication 
that also ombudsman offices, they see themselves as someone that can not only improve the quality of services that are provided to the public by, by, the, private, uh, by the public sector, but also actually in, impacts the level of policies that can then impact the delivery to the public. Um, so how, how do the ombudsman offices perceive uh, and see their participation to public government's reforms? What specifically in their pra actual practice are they contributing to? So in, in the, if you look at the level of the mandate, uh, they, the answers indicate that 71% of the institutions who responded, uh, they contribute to public administration reforms. Um, but 68% also contributes to legislative, sorry, 71% um, um, contribute to legislative reforms. Only 32% feels that they contribute specifically to open government uh, reforms. Um, but then this is also something that is open for reflection because uh, what does it actually mean that only 32% contribute to open government when we said that all what we are doing is to promote transparency, uh, civic participation, and accountability of public institutions. So somehow we have also to see what kind of legislative reforms we are contributing and how we are, even if it's a reform that uh, has to do with pensions or, or access to education, how the principles of open government are actually reinforced through these different uh, legislative reforms. So here there is a room to do a, a more in-depth analysis of how open government principles are actually reinforced through other actions. Um, so um, uh, this is the, res the replies vis-a-vis -vis the question, are ombudsman institutions involved in the national open government agenda? Um, unfortunately, we have, as you can see, this is a very clear graph. It's, it says that the involvement in open government plan or strategy is very low. Um, and as well, the involvement in open government coordination mechanism. Uh, is only 9% in one case and only 14% in the other case. Um, but again, I think here on this, when we are talking about this, we are really thinking about is this, um, so this is the formal, in, formal in engagement of the ombudsman offices in uh, a national strategy or a national action plan on open government. But it doesn't count the, let's say, more implicit involvement in promoting open government principles. Some of the good practices. Um, so this is, we're talking about the formalized involvement of ombudsman offices vis-a-vis uh, -vis, um, open government reforms, specifically in Ireland, again, uh, the um, office of the ombudsman have submitted proposal for open government action plans. So they, they are actually playing a role to promote a more formalized open government agenda. Uh, as well in Norway has been, the Ombudsman Office has been invited to open government uh, uh, related meetings uh, for the formulation of a more specific open government agenda. Um, and then the same in Greece, we have a direct involvement of the Ombudsman Office in uh, supporting an open government action plan. Um, so, how do ombudsman offices perceive their contribution to open government? Through which mechanisms? Um, here also is a very interesting graph because it says that 48% they, they feel, they perceive that they are not promoting to open government. They are not, they are not contributing to promote open government. Um, but then we know that um, that ombudsman offices, they have a lot of information materials, studies and research, seminars and trainings that are actually promoting these principles. So yes, the ones that are promoting, they, they do it through these mechanisms, but then what is specifically in the 48% also, it would be interesting to know more about that. Um, so, 
So how do ombudsmen and if do ombudsman offices participate in the policy cycle? Um, policy cycle, you know, envisage as really the whole process of shaping priorities for policies, then drafting uh, a policy document, then uh, monitoring the implementation and the impact on, on the uh, expected audience. Um, so in, in the survey, five institutions have statistics on citizen participation complaints. Um, so they, they actually use uh, their, their findings, their, their cases to actually uh, propose certain, uh, certain uh, reforms, uh, conducting investigation on citizen participation upon their own initiative. Um, so also, um, how are ombudsman offices actually looking into specific open government issues, so not just as a side uh, responsibility, but as the main focus of their investigation. How many cases of the cases that you look at are actually looking at, for example, uh, citizens' access to participation? Um, there is some examples here that are very interesting. So the, the citizen participation is not a mechanism to make, for example, a better, I don't know, pension reform, but actually they are looked at as the main focus of the investigation itself. Um, here you have uh, some, some good practice again from Latvia address complaints about the lack of a proper, t proper community consultation process in relation to territorial planning. So some countries are taking uh, active steps to actually look into how uh, civic engagement and, and public consultations is implemented inside the countries. Um, the, there might be also a legal requirement, of course, for that, but there is also um, an ethical requirement. In Estonia, a chancellor received a petition from people of a local municipality complaining that the local government did not react to their proposal to organize a survey among the population. So here is different examples of how citizens actually reacted and consulted with the ombudsman while they felt that they were not consulted for public policy uh, development, uh, which is very interesting because that means also that the public has actually perceived that the ombudsman would have a role in enhancing and strengthening their uh, ability and right to participate in public consultation for policy making. Um, this also, it's, um, well, another example which is not really investigated in the, uh, in the, in the survey. This is the room for more, for more work. Uh, what, or if, would the Ombudsman Office had a role uh, in strengthening transparency and lobbying activity and revolving door practices? Of course, there is laws in, that are uh, concerning this issue in many countries, so there, there could be a, a space, a room for ombudsman offices to involve in this, in this matter, but that is an aspect that is, is, is a question mark, is not really, was not really in, analyzed in depth during the study. Um, so, um, here we are talking about perceptions of the ombudsman offices about their role in promoting open government. I think we talked a lot about that, but some more uh, answers, uh, some more findings uh, were also released in the study. Um, some some, uh, some institutions are, for example, conducting internal reflections on that, on what they could do more. Um, the UK Parliamentary Ombudsman works with Parliament departments and national health organization according to its principle of being open and accountable. Um, UK, again, the UK Parliamentary Ombudsman incorporated transparency, accountability and participation in the principles of good complaint handling, good administration and remedy. So there are actually some ombudsmen are starting to mainstream open government in the work of other institutions and realizing more and more what they can, what their potential is to do that. Um, what is some of the biggest challenges to engage in national open government reforms? Um, well, here you see the highest is lack of political will to involve the ombudsman, absence of a national open government strategy, lack of capacity and expertise, again, it comes back. 
um, so some of these reasons that are perceived as challenges are external. So it's kind of other institutions would not see favorably uh, the involvement of ombudsman offices more and more in promoting public, uh, public governance, but also some internal challenges, again, related to expertise and capacity. Um, just to draw a few, a few final uh, conclusions, after all this information, I hope that you had the time to absorb them. Uh, you have the, um, the study on your table, I believe. This is the study which was nicely um, published, um, and you can consult in more detail. But I think uh, out of all this uh, preliminary study and preliminary assessment, I think there is some, a big message coming out. First of all, uh, that uh, through your culture and your practice um, and, and what you do on your daily basis, there is already a strong involvement of ombudsman offices in promoting open government through all what they do in strengthening transparency of the public sector, strengthening accountability to the public, and really strengthening public consultation processes that go not only from consultations, but to real partnership with, with different level of stakeholders. So you, um, for sure, besides what your mandate is, there is a, a level of practice that is strongly anchored in open government principles, and that show that there is a big potential to do more on that level. So that is something that we would like to leave as, as a question at the end of this presentation. So how, uh, how in your country, I know that of course every country has a different context and every ombudsman institution has a different somehow framework. Um, so how within your, your context um, and uh, this, this involvement and responsibility of ombudsman offices could be upscaled, could be optimized and capitalized on uh, to actually have a greater impact for better policies. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Elena. Indeed, I think quite a groundbreaking uh, preliminary study, but very groundbreaking and some very thorough insights and I think food for thought for all of you and all of us. So to comment and uh, give us some of their own ideas on, on some of your very important findings and especially I think the challenging challenge part of it, uh, I'm joined now by Emily O'Reilly, of course, the European Ombudsman. Uh, Elena will stay here as well to answer some of your uh, questions. And uh, delighted to have with us Peter Tindall, Irish Ombudsman and President of the IOI, uh, as well as Marc Bertrand, Ombudsman of Wallonia and of the Wallonia Brussels Federation, but also President of the Association des Ombudsmen et Médiateurs de la Francophonie. So uh, some people who are really involved in some of the things that Elena has talked about. And then, of course, I'll open the floor to questions and comments from yourself as well. Just to start off with you, Emily, I think, um, was there anything here that really struck you as uh, unexpected, something that you were surprised by, or something that's actually given you indications for the future, how you want to proceed? Um, I, th I think, over, first of all, I want to thank the OECD very much for, um, for, for doing this survey for us and, and for the great participation uh, of the colleagues and, and the other um, institutions uh, and <clears throat> the other networks. Um, and I think it's interesting what you said about this was a sort of a fairly unique uh, for you that I don't think we had really impinged on your consciousness perhaps before this and I think that's a very good outcome for all of us if the, uh, the recognition of the role of the Ombudsman is now much stronger in an organization as, as important uh, as yours I think that's one very good outcome. Um, I think it shows a number of things I think it must be recognized that this is a, a relatively new initiative uh, the, the Open Government uh, Program Partnership and, and I think that is reflected in to some extent somewhat confused and, and fractured findings, I think, uh, in it. Um, I, I think what I picked up was that, for example, some of us are doing open government, but we don't recognize it as, as that. Um, and I also think that, that people perhaps don't really fully understand what, what it means and, and, and what it is. Uh, I think people who are, who are players, who are actors in that, um, who are experts, 
do understand it and do get it, but I think there's um, a slight uh, hesitation mm. uh, among others, including, including ourselves, in, in, in relation uh, to it, and I think that comes across. But I also think in terms of the, the barriers, I think that there are two. Some of them perhaps are, are external, you know, the, the government itself isn't too keen on open, open government or our resources don't allow us to, to develop it more. That's one thing, that's external. Perhaps also there are uh, internal barriers uh, in relation to how uh, we see the extent to which we can really embrace mm. this. And that could be down to our own mandate, that it's quite limited. For example, some of us have very wide mandates that cover human rights, equality, gender discrimination, uh, all of those sort of issues. Others are, 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 much more, are much more narrow. But I also think there can be um, philosophical barriers to it as well, that uh, unless the head of an organization, unless the ombudsman really gets it, really wants it, and really understands that it is absolutely within the mandate mm. of an ombudsman uh, to embrace this, then I think that institutionally people, um, uh, people won't. And I think the one thing that unites uh, all of us is that we all deal with complaints. The extent to which we move outside of that into own initiatives, into engaging with, mm. with open government, into all of that, into really seeing what our role is above and beyond that of simple complaint handler, I think that defines the extent to which um, ombudsman institutions will, uh, will, in, will engage with this. And I think the, the, the work that we do here, and, and it just, just from listening to you, uh, I think um, I, I feel that this is something that we, and certainly with the, with the various networks, um, can do more with in terms of sensitizing um, our uh, colleagues and ourselves to the work, and in, uh, particularly in terms of sensitizing us to the potential of it. And I'll just finish on this. I think Sanjay said something very interesting yesterday, which to me encapsulated where we are in all of this. If you have the people, you know, on, on, on the one hand, generally powerless vis-a-vis -vis the institutions. Then you have the administration. The people want something. The people want their voices to be heard. They want to input into policy making and so on. And we're in the middle. We're there. We can, we can mark that divide, not by being advocates as such, not by proselytizing, not by being political, but through the way in which we do our cases and through the extent to which we move outside of that and look to see where we can bring our specific skills of investigation, of analysis to bear on public policy areas which will show uh, in, a very, in a very clear way and a very non-partisan way uh, just how these policies could be implemented and how they can they help, uh, help, help citizens, help people. Just a quick follow-up for you, Emily, though. Um, so give us some examples of your own work in open governance, and how do you find the EU institutions that you're engaging with on a daily basis? Uh, how, how is their attitude to open governance? Well, we, d we did ask um, the Commission uh, through Vice Pres uh, President Timmermans about, was it two years ago, Aidan, about two years ago, uh, to consider uh, becoming a member of the, of, of the uh, OGP. Uh, and, and there was reluctance at the time. I think they wanted to, I think perhaps they feel that they have so many things to be accountable to, uh, that, that this was just, just one more. But I mean, we certainly see potential in that. And we actually do think that it is a place that the Commission and other institutions should be involved in. Now, I know Sanjay had a conversation with Vice President Timmermans yesterday. It'd be interesting to see whether uh, anything came from that. But I mean, you saw in the slides there the work that we do. We're very much into uh, citizen engagement, participation. A lot of the own initiative investigations that we do involve public consultation. We've done a lot of work on the European uh, Citizens Initiative, yep. uh, none of which have come to fruition. I mean, no Citizens Initiative has been adopted as a proposed piece of legislation so far, even no. though it's now been in place um, uh, for five years. Obviously, transparency is a big piece. I talked a lot about that yesterday in relation to the need to inform uh, citizens right across um, the EU of what's, what's being done uh, in their name. Um, also, in relation to, yeah, yeah uh, involving people in, in, in policy making, uh, we've done a lot of work, for example, in relation to um, the translation of public policy documents and uh, um, uh, public consultations into all of the EU languages, mm -hmm. because how can you participate if you don't understand the language in which you're participating? So it's something that is, uh, that is very central 
um, to, to the work that we're doing. I suppose, in a sense, we're in a different space, though. It's not that we're so wonderful at open government. It's that, <laughs> almost by default, the issues that we deal with, uh, you know, transparency, ethics, and all of those uh, are, are not ones that are always to the forefront of the work of the member state ombudsman because I do not deal, generally speaking, with what you would call the bread and butter issues of people's lives, mm -hmm. which is what most of the colleagues do. Social protection, um, uh, housing, uh, education, pensions, all of those I issues. Whereas the, the ones that, that come to me tend to be more in the areas that are mm -hmm. quite central to uh, sort of, I suppose, the overarching principles of, of open government. Right, thank you very much. So, uh, Peter, let's turn to you. Your comments on what you heard and saw. Um, just picking up in a sense where, where Emily left off, I was intrigued to see that 3% of respondents don't deal with complaints. And if you're here, <laughs> what do you do? <laughs> um, I think what... <laughs> I think... Um, what it reflects is the huge diversity of ombudsman offices, the way that the institution has been able to adapt to the different um, requirements of the different countries in which we work. Um, it also reflects the fact, I think, clearly that what we do is a lot of it about open government as a matter of course, in the sense that accountability is one of the fundamental principles of open government and that what we are about at our core is about accountability, holding administrations to account for what they're doing on behalf of citizens. So in that sense, the Ombudsman is a natural participant in the open government agenda. One of the things that didn't come across to me in the survey is this whole sense of open data, which to an extent, it seems to me, has hijacked a lot of the open government agenda internationally, mm -hmm. so that people are more interested in the reuse of government data and the commercial possibilities of the reuse of government data than they are actually in the principles of open government, which were very well elucidated at the beginning of the presentation. And I guess if there is a role for us both as ombudsman, networks, representative bodies, and so on, in getting a toehold back in open government. It is about that broader agenda, the broader agenda of openness, of transparency, of accountability, where we are, are more natural inhabitants of that space rather than some of the multinational companies who see this as a very considerable business opportunity. I think I was surprised at the percentage of relatively high percentage of ombudsman bodies who do have responsibility for transparency, for information, um, for freedom of information and so on. I think that's probably higher than I would have expected. Um, certainly that's the case with my office. It's a very useful adjunct to the overall complaint work. Um, internationally, anti-corruption also forms a very large part, though perhaps less so in a European context, but again, that fits very well with the agenda. So the question for me is, how do we actually occupy this space? How do we as ombudsman institutions and networks find our voice within the open government um, community? How do we have a greater presence? For instance, I went to the um, International Open Government Summit in Paris this year. I suspect I was the only ombudsman to participate and so I think if, if we're to be serious about stepping up our efforts, then we have to, as individually at um, national level, continue to engage where our countries do have open government action plans. We can have a particular role to play in actually, Emily talked about own initiative work, in looking at whether the commitments of those action plans are actually being, national action plans are being delivered on. But we also have to find a way of broadening the agenda nationally, each of us, to make sure that our own governments are actually taking this as a, a serious issue and are embarked on that journey towards more openness, towards more accountability, towards more citizen engagement. And I think probably the one cautionary note 
in all of this is that part of the reason that ombudsman offices sometimes can be wary about collaboration is the difficulty in collaborating with organizations who are in your jurisdiction to in a sense um, undermine your objectivity it may be seen to be from the citizen perspective to be too close to the bodies in your jurisdiction and i think there is a tightrope to be walked there that you have to on the one hand be able to engage with those bodies with a view to improving their practices but on the other hand not to be seen to collaborate so closely as to put doubt in the mind of your citizen way forward and maybe some uh, experience that you've had how do you how do ombudsmen how can they actually push for open government policies I, in practice I mean is it is it by forming coalitions is it by using social media is it through uh, advocacy how, how would you actually do it well I think um, on the network level um, we have to engage more as we have been doing with OECD and other players and with the Open Government Partnership, for instance, the IOI has also been working with the World Bank in respect of open government. So I think it's, um, there is a, an, an international level at which we have to operate. At the national level, people should be making sure that they are inserting themselves into those action plans, that they're monitoring the action plans. But also, I think, in our work, I think, as Emily said, in many of the reports that we produce into our investigations, we can highlight a lack of openness, a lack of transparency, and we can make recommendations, as we've heard, as to how legislation can be changed, as to how practices can be changed in our own countries to make them more open and transparent. Right. Thank you very much. So let, let's turn to Marc Bertrand. The same question for you, Marc. Uh, what surprised you? What encouraged you? What challenged you? Je voudrais tout d'abord aussi remercier euh, l'OCDE d'avoir pris l'initiative et le média la médiatrice européenne d'avoir soutenu euh, concrètement cette initiative. Pourquoi est-ce que j'insiste par cela Parce que voici déjà quelques temps, euh, certaines personnes se sont rencontrées un moment et se sont dit tiens, et notamment à l'OCDE, ces ombudsmen finalement, qu'est-ce qu'ils font Et en quoi est-ce que ces ombudsmen pourraient contribuer à cette réflexion qui est déjà ancienne finalement, cette stratégie au niveau euh, de l'OCDE Un des angles d'attaque, c'était la question de l'intervention de plusieurs ombudsmen dans la lutte contre la corruption. C'était assez inconnu au niveau de l'OCDE que plusieurs de nos collègues avaient un rôle précis euh, au niveau des institutions de l'État pour par exemple, protéger les lanceurs d'alerte, euh, participer à, à, à l'enquête qui peut mener finalement à découvrir des faits de corruption et à les dénoncer euh, au système judiciaire. Et de ces réflexions, et je dois ici associer aussi l'AOM, dont le président malheureusement n'est ne, pas présent aujourd'hui puisque euh, le président euh, sortant de cette association, je tiens à le dire très gentiment, euh, n'a pas été renouvelé dans son mandat, dans son pays, dans des circonstances qu'à titre personnel je trouve tout à fait euh, curieuses, pour utiliser un terme euh, diplomatique. On pourrait d'ailleurs parler aussi de l'open government et de l'open open state dans, dans, dans plusieurs pays où même la fonction de l'ombudsman peut être remise en cause et son indépendance au moment de son choix. C'est une parenthèse que je ferme euh, immédiatement. Donc je tiens vraiment à vous remercier d'avoir mené euh, euh, finalement cette enquête et, et, et d'avoir euh, pu nous présenter les résultats aujourd'hui. Et je vais répondre à votre question, ne vous inquiétez pas. Euh, deuxièmement, je, je, je trouve que le, le premier grand résultat, c'est effectivement toute la première partie. C'est aujourd'hui d'avoir refait, il en existe d'autres, mais d'avoir actualisé un état des lieux des institutions d'Ombudsman. Non seulement en Europe, mais aussi en dehors de l'Europe. Et... Je trouve aussi que c'est une donnée très intéressante. J'ai eu l'occasion de parler avec certaines personnes. Ce serait évidemment très intéressant aussi de pouvoir à un moment affiner les réponses en fonction de la situation de l'institution sur son continent, mm. son niveau de, de, de développement, les compétences de l'institution. Donc ici, vous nous présentez un premier tableau. Évidemment, il y a beaucoup de matières sur lesquelles on pourrait euh, travailler pour euh, avoir des éléments d'information et alors s'inscrire dans des stratégies que vous avez euh, déjà mentionnées euh, tout à l'heure. 
Alors, c'est clair que, pour revenir à votre question, la surprise, c'est que ce n'est pas vraiment une surprise, mais nous contribuons tous, par nos, au moyen de nos compétences, à, à renforcer euh, le, le gouvernement ouvert, l'open government, l'open state dans nos différents pays. Mais c'est vrai qu'on est vraiment au début de cette approche. C'est tout à fait clair. Plusieurs, je, moi je viens de Belgique, la notion de gouvernement ouvert n'est pas une notion qui est utilisée tous les 15 jours dans les médias et dans l'action politique dans mon pays. Pas du tout. Il y a des pays qui sont vraiment engagés, d'autres qui le sont beaucoup moins, qui sont début. Et donc, la situation de notre institution, elle est parallèle à cela. Mais nous faisons déjà beaucoup. Quand on parle de la transparence, de la responsabilité, de la participation, nous venons déjà de le dire, et, et le, la, la première partie du, du questionnaire le montre très clairement, nous participons déjà par notre capacité de formuler des recommandations et par le suivi qui est donné à nos recommandations, nous y participons très clairement. Évidemment, pour la deuxième partie, nous ne sommes pour la plupart pas directement impliqués lorsqu'il y a une réflexion au niveau de l'État. Nous ne sommes pas directement impliqués. Je rejoins assez ce qui a été dit. Attention d'être trop impliqués aussi. Nous sommes des institutions indépendantes. Nous, ne faisons, nous, nous avons une fonction de contrôle aussi qui nous est confiée aussi par les citoyens. Attention de ne pas prendre une partie trop grande aussi en tant que telle dans euh, euh, le, le, le développement, dans la stratégie du gouvernement ouvert. Je pense que nous avons une place, mais notre place, ça reste celle d'une institution indépendante euh, qui est, qu est le médiateur. Alors peut-être tout à l'heure, vous aurez une question sur le rôle que nous pourrions jouer en tant que, que réseau, mais je peux déjà le, non, le dire maintenant. C'est clair que notre responsabilité en tant que réseau, c'est effectivement de, de propager aussi le, 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 le projet, le concept, nous faisons tout ça à d'autres niveaux, nous, nous, par, le, par nos réunions de formation, nos séminaires de formation, nos réunions plus, stati, plus statutaires, nos ateliers de travail. C'est clair que nous travaillons non seulement sur des sujets d'intérêt commun, mais aussi sur des sujets de prospective, des sujets euh, d'avenir. Et C'est clair qu'un un des premiers rôles euh, des réseaux, et, et vraiment je, je m'engage au niveau de mon réseau, mais je pense que c'est le même engagement que nous pouvons prendre euh, au niveau de tous les réseaux, c'est effectivement de travailler beaucoup plus et d'échanger avec les institutions d'Ombudsman qui ont déjà une expertise, qui peuvent faire part de ce qui est bien, de ce qui n'est pas bien, de nous rendre attentifs aux difficultés et euh, finalement de pouvoir contribuer tous ensemble, tôt ou tard, à plus de transparence, plus de participation et plus euh, de responsabilité dans nos différents États. Uh, so, so, Mark, you said, and, and I think very rightly everyone will agree with you, that the notion of open government is actually just now coming into, let's say, the public sphere, right? But within your network, is there traction, is there an attraction for the concept? Are people interested in it? And is it something that, you know, uh, echoes with them, resonates, and they want to take it forward? Pour être tout à fait honnête, en tant que tel, nous n'avons jamais eu vraiment l'occasion. Mais voici deux ans, nous avons tenu notre dernière Assemblée Générale au Québec. Et durant cette Assemblée Générale, tout le processus a déjà été présenté par un, un, un représentant de, de l'OCDE. Donc il y avait vraiment un intérêt. Ça a été une partie non négligeable de notre Assemblée Générale. C'était aussi sous l'angle de la bonne gouvernance, la bonne administration, mais aussi du rôle des médiateurs comme intervenant pour lutter contre la corruption. Ça a été aussi cet angle-là qui a été utilisé, euh, qui a été mis en, en exergue mm -hmm. durant notre euh, conférence. Donc, nous avons commencé la réflexion, mais maintenant, il faut lui donner un peu du, du, du contenu et du mm -hmm. corps. Donc, jusqu'à présent, peu de choses, mais vraiment, il y a, il y a un engagement euh, qui, qui est fait. Je dois vous dire, par exemple, nous travaillons par, pour le moment sur un code d'éthique. À titre personnel, j'ai été surpris de voir que autant d'institutions avaient un code d'éthique, un code de déontologie. Je suis agréablement surpris de ce résultat. Ma, ma connaissance, c'était que la plupart des institutions ont quelques règles en matière d'éthique, mais je pense que peu ont vraiment un code détaillé de la mise en œuvre de la déontologie professionnelle euh, des médiateurs. 
Ce n'est pas directement lié, mais ça contribue quand même euh, au, au renforcement de, de, du médiateur euh, en direction euh, du gouvernement ouvert. Donc voilà, c'est un engagement à travailler plus concrètement, peut-être à partir d'aujourd'hui, oui. euh, mais euh, je crois que nous allons le faire. Ok, thank you very much. Awareness raising has been, uh, has been one of your uh, principles, I guess. Uh, I'd like to now open the floor to questions and comments from yourselves. Uh, once again, my only plea is that you be brief, so we can actually go back to the panel and maybe get more, more questions and comments from the floor uh, as well. So please just uh, put up your hand. We have, I think, uh, roving microphones uh, for people to come in and uh, for you to take uh, make your comments and questions. Anyone coming in at this stage? Yes, please. Rosemary Agnew? Yes. Just Morning. introduce yourself again. Yeah. Rosemary Agnew, Scottish Public Services Ombudsman. Um, I have a question for the panel generally about engagement. Um, I agree, by the way, Peter, with you on your comment about Paris. I was there as an information commissioner, and I was really surprised at how few commissioners and ombudsmen there were around. Um, back to my question. You talked about engagement, and you seem to have focused on engagement with institutions, but one of the principles, as I understand it, of open government is it's also engagement with citizens and third sector. So do you feel there is a role for ombudsmen to engage the other way and help citizens use their voice and exercise it effectively? Thank you, Rosemary. Would, uh, Peter, would you like to take that up? Um, yes, there is, and clearly there are quite a number of examples emerging in the research as to the way ombudsman offices are engaging. Certainly, and we looked at some of the examples there, work with NGOs representing particular sectors, whether that be older people or people with disabilities, direct conversations with people in those um, particular groups also important. We heard about the example in your own office of the, the sounding boards. Um, most ombudsman offices, in my experience, at some stage consult their users um, to get a sense of how their service is perceived. I think I, I find the, the, the personal outreach, actually going out there and meeting people, having your staff travel around the country and making themselves available to people. I'd use a particular example. Um, a lot of ombudsman offices are engaged in work with refugees and asylum seekers. Um, those people will have a natural distrust of authority given the circumstances in which they find themselves. They probably won't have a good grasp of the principal language of your country. So actually getting out to those people where they are and talking to them has been one of the very best examples of ombudsman practice. And I think there's probably a role there. The articulate sections of our communities are quite capable of representing themselves. People who complain to us are people who typically depend on public services to a much greater extent than others. And in a sense, our, our daily work, what, what Emily described as the bread and butter, is giving voice to those people. It is about listening to those people. And I think the, the interest, the, the, the mention was made of mediation. Um, and I think that has a, you know, can have quite specialist or can have quite broad meaning. But the sense in which we listen to people um, in their struggles, in their daily struggles um, with the providers of public services is one of the most useful things that we can continue to do. In terms, of, um, in terms of broader engagement, I think that some of the initiatives that are being used to, for instance, Emily mentioned the engaging with members of the public. We, on an own initiative investigation, used focus groups of people who had complained about service, but also people who'd been dissatisfied with service and chose not to complain to try and get a greater understanding. So I think ombudsman offices are in innovative in the way that they try and give voice to people who often, by the nature of their circumstances, are voiceless within our communities. Emily, please. 
just, just reflecting on what my two colleagues said in relation to our independence and being um, independent of, of institutions and so on, yes, uh, absolutely, of course. Our greatest strength um, is our independence. That is also our, our greatest weapon, the greatest tool that we have in order to get our, our recommendations accepted. Um, but I think it's, it's also not just being independent of institutions, it's actually also being independent of our complainants as well. Um, I think that, that that is a very important piece because we will only get traction uh, from the institutions if they believe that they have been treated fairly uh, and that we don't automatically cleave to the, the point of view without a uh, very strong forensic analysis of, of the complaint. And I think that that is really um, critically important. And I think the points they have made are important in relation to our engagement with this. We cannot be seen to be just another NGO. Uh, that's very important. Uh, obviously, a, a lot of us, some of the, the best complaints in terms of those that have the most significant public interest uh, come to my office from the NGOs. And, and it's a very, it can be a sensitive uh, area for us because on the one hand, they're very often very you know, high quality complaints that have been well researched by themselves. On the other hand, we don't want to be seen to be, and this is a verb that one of my colleagues said to me a few years ago, which I hadn't heard before, we don't want to be seen to be instrumentalized <laughs> by, uh, by civil society. So that is a tightrope that we all walk, but which is very important in order to preserve our independence. But just this morning when I was getting ready to come here, I was listening to British radio, as one does, uh, <laughs> BBC Radio 4, uh, and there was a preview of a program that was coming up later uh, this morning. It was a consumer program. And the presenter was asking people uh, to ring in, arising out of the Grenfell Tower disaster, saying, Tell us how you have made your voice heard. Have you been able in a certain situation uh, to make your voice heard? And how have, you, um, how have you achieved that? And I suppose for all of us in any of our countries, it would be interesting for us to know to what extent the Ombudsman had been uh, the way in which uh, uh, the voice, uh, their voices had been heard. But where I think it is important, uh, and it doesn't Im impinge on our independence in relation to uh, whether institutions, but particularly with, 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 with the people, is that their voices are heard by us. I often say to, to my colleagues, even if people don't get a good result, the fact that somebody has listened to them is such a stress reliever. They have been heard. We experience this in our daily lives, ringing up a bank, a mobile phone provider, trying to find a human voice who actually listens to the damn complaint and, and, and not processes it by way of a, a particular sheet of paper that they're reading from some strange country. Um, and, and I think we can certainly do that. Uh, we, we can be that voice, but not the, not the advocate. I don't particularly like the use of the word advocacy with, 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 with ombudsman. I don't believe that what we are, that is what we are. It can be the outcome of what we do, the complaints that we deal with, that leads to policy change. It's not that we've advocated that policy change, but it becomes inevitable given the outcome of our uh, mm -hmm. complaints. Thank you very much. Some very important points uh, that you've made uh, there, Emily. Marc Bertrand, would you like to come in on this issue? Should we move on? So uh, would anyone else like to come in with a question? Yes, please, um, gentlemen over there. And I'd also like, you know, something that uh, Peter said about giving voice to people who are voiceless. And so many of you must be actually working with migrants and refugees. And I was just wondering if you had any experiences or anything that you would like to share with the rest of us on how difficult or easy it is to have open government uh, initiatives when you can't really give, um, you know, people don't speak the language and can't really connect with, uh, with the institutions. But please, sir. Je suis le ombudsman du Pays Basque et je voulais confirmer quelque chose qui a été dit par, le, par les membres du, du panel. Euh, concernant le fait que, de toute façon, l'Ombudsman est le destinataire naturel, un intervenant naturel dans les processus, les procédures de, de transparence et de participation. Dans beaucoup de, de, de constitutions, le droit à la participation est inscrit et euh, le, il appartient à l'Ombudsman de le, de le de, de les défendre. C'est pour ça que le, le, le destinataire naturel de beaucoup de plaintes en matière de de accès à l'information, de motivation de décision, d'intervention, de, de consultation publique, d'accès aux informations en matière d'environnement, d'impact euh, euh, sur l'environnement, des, des, des projets 
d'infrastructures, etc., se sont adressés à l'Ombudsman. Et au fur et à mesure qu'il y a plus une législation qui va de l'avant dans ce domaine, nous recevons de plus en plus de plaintes. Euh, nous venons de recevoir, par exemple, au Pays Basque, des plaintes sur la participation des municipalités sur les projets d'extension de, 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 du métro. Euh, on veut qu'il soit, les, les, les citoyens veulent être consultés sur le fait si le métro va aller, va aller ici ou là et comment ils peuvent participer, comment ils peuvent être consultés. C'est toute la question sur laquelle nous sommes euh, consultés. Et je voulais poser une question pour la, une question pour la réflexion qui s'est posée, qui s'est posée chez nous. Euh, souvent, le, le, les administrations public ou les municipalités et, ou euh, les gouvernements qui essayent de promouvoir la transparence euh, trouvent des limites dans le domaine de la dans, le, avec des, dans les normes relatives à la protection des données. Euh, je me réfère à une affaire euh, concrète qui, euh, dans laquelle une municipalité du Pays Basque a décidé d'envoyer de transmettre par streaming toutes les informations, tous les débats publics sur tout ce qui concerne la municipalité. Et en plus, ils ont publié sur le site web des informations sur tous les membres de l'administration locale, y compris les policiers euh, locaux, avec leur nom, leur grade et, le, euh, et, et, et leur salaire. Ça fait l'objet d'une plainte auprès de la commission de la protection des données qui a donné raison aux policiers parce que justement, leurs données personnelles avaient été publiées. Donc il y a un point de friction là qui n'est pas facile à résoudre et je voudrais peut-être entendre des commentaires des membres du panel sur ce, ce, cet équilibre à trouver entre protection de données, vie privée et transparence. Merci. Merci beaucoup. Uh, I'll turn to you, Marc, uh, because you also wanted to answer my question and perhaps... Je, je dois dire que sur cette dernière question, je n'ai pas une grande expérience, donc je ne vais pas... Je pense que le problème se pose effectivement très régulièrement, aussi dans notre job d'ombudsman. J'ai vécu un cas un peu similaire au vôtre, mais la, la protection des données personnelles privées était entre deux ex-époux. Les enfants, les, les, un ex-époux devait introduire un dossier, mais pour bénéficier d'une aide, devait renseigner les revenus de son ex-époux. Mais il est dit, mais moi, je n'ai rien à voir avec ça. Et effectivement, on s'est posé la question de savoir euh, quelle était la limite de l'intervention de l'administration pour connaître, pour interférer dans, dans la vie familiale. Ce n'est pas un cas directement lié au vôtre, mais cette question, elle revient régulièrement. Jusqu'où peut-on aller dans, dans le travail, dans les recommandations, sans heurter toutes les législations qui, qui, qui protègent euh, les données euh, personnelles. Euh, mais je pense que mes collègues vont peut-être répondre, mais je voudrais aussi répondre, excusez-moi d'être un peu... Nous avons, euh, dans mon institution, vraiment une expérience qui est vraiment intéressante et passionnante. Nous travaillons maintenant depuis un certain temps avec ce que nous appelons, c'est leur nom, le réseau Wallon de lutte contre la pauvreté, qui regroupe un ensemble d'associations qui travaille avec les personnes en situation de précarité. Et donc, nous nous voyons régulièrement, non seulement, pas seulement pour faire connaître les, les services que peut offrir l'institution de l'Ombudsman, mais aussi concrètement pour travailler sur des, des recommandations, sur des analyses de situation. Parce qu'effectivement, petit à petit, on peut très vite, et c'est vrai qu'on doit aller partout dans le pays, mais petit à petit, nous pouvons très vite ne plus travailler qu'en vase clos et d'oublier notamment les personnes qui peut-être ont encore plus besoin de, de, de l'aide euh, du médiateur et de l'ombudsman. Ça a vraiment ouvert les esprits aux collaborateurs d'avoir ces rencontres régulières. On vient nous parler de situations concrètes. Mm -hmm. Très clairement, ces personnes en situation de précarité, lorsqu'ils sont confrontés à une difficulté administrative, ils essayent une fois et puis après, ils n'essayent plus parce qu'ils se sentent complètement exclus. S'il n'y a pas des institutions comme les nôtres qui peuvent dire « Mais non, vous avez le droit et on va défendre le droit euh, auquel vous, vous, vous pouvez euh, prétendre ». Donc pour nous, c'est vraiment important de travailler avec ce type d'association, pas simplement s'informer, mais vraiment travailler concrètement pour ouvrir les esprits euh, des collaborateurs de l'institution qui, qui travaillent au jour le jour sur les, les, les réclamations. I see. Peter, would you like to 
come to the question. Thank you very much, Mark, for that. Um, right by our gentleman from the Basque Country. A barrier, if you like, to the release of mm. information under freedom of information, and it's the way those two regimes interact, and particularly with the new European data protection directive. And I think we're going to find ourselves looking perhaps at a, a narrower range of information becoming available. We've always had this challenge in Ireland because there's a constitutional protection for privacy and because the courts have given a very narrow definition of what the public interest is. So consequently, there's information that you would instinctively want to see in the public domain that can't be. And as we speak, um, this morning I have a draft decision to look at about the salaries of broadcasters in the state television company where all of these issues are at play. Um, I'm not going to tell you what my decision will be. I think that would be unfair. But I think it is it, that, that whole interplay is a complex one. Um, I think we need to think about what is in the legitimate interests of the people of our mm. countries to know in respect of transparency without, in a sense, imp impinging too much on the privacy of individuals. But our general view should be that if you work in public life, then you have to expect that there will be greater transparency and openness in respect of your personal information than would be the case where you were a private citizen. Hmm. Emily, it's a tough one, isn't it? Well, it's, it's, it's something I've spoken about quite a lot because I fully agree with, with, with Peter, possibly because we obviously uh, both uh, come from, from the same uh, jurisdiction and have experienced the same, that data protection within the EU can be used in ways which are something like out of Alice in Wonderland or something. Mm. It's just, uh, I've seen decisions that have been made that seem <coughs> just completely illogical often. For example, I might see a record and it's uh, signed by somebody. So let's say, for example, Emily O'Reilly, European Ombudsman, and European Ombudsman would be there, but Emily O'Reilly would have been sort of, uh, you know, whitened out. And as far as I know, I am the only European Ombudsman. So. Uh, equally, I was, I was making a decision in relation to, um, uh, related to a, a former commissioner, and there were data protection issues in it, and at the end, of, I was, the, the, the ruling was that I could uh, say what position this person had held, just not name the person, but, you know, I was identifying this person anyway, so, so it seemed to me a, a strange um, twist on, on data protection. But, but, but what our colleague was saying over there, I mean, I think, again, Peter and I come from um, a, a jurisdiction which was accepted that if you were working in your, in your public role as a public official that you would expect to be identified, you know, within that public role. So, you know, Peter Tyndall, uh, ombudsman, uh, you know, uh, was at a public meeting in his ombudsman role. Peter Tyndall as private citizen, it, 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 it might be different. But I do agree with that, uh, as, as Peter said, and I've said it a few times as well, that it is often used as a shield, inappropriately, against uh, transparency. I don't know in the case that you mentioned there whether the policeman was there just as a, as a citizen and he objected to uh, you know, his, his image or his name being there, or whether he was there as a representative of, of a public institution, in which case it should, not, uh, it should not have been an issue if people were there to make decisions which um, were affecting uh, the public interest, then, then that should be out there. Thank you very much. Um, happy to take some more comments or questions from, uh, from you. Yes, please. Yes, please, afterwards. The gentleman over there first, yeah. Good morning. Uh, Alessandro Bellantoni from the OECD. So my intervention is in fact, uh, well, to thank all of you for the opportunity you gave us to work with you, but also uh, to react a little bit uh, uh, on a couple of things I've heard, uh, because I have the impression that our goal as the OECD is twofold. On the one hand, we want to underline to the executives of our member countries the importance of ombudsman institutions in the policy making cycle. Because I liked very much what uh, Madame O'Reilly said, that advocacy should be the outcome of your work. 
but that is the case only if governments are capable of intercepting your, uh, your inputs and include them in the policy making cycle at the beginning of it, especially when this has to do with public sector reform and open government, which is the topic of today's discussion. And in our experience, unfortunately, a lot of policy discussions are politically uh, inspired uh, and not data driven. And you are the owner of a lot of very relevant data that should be the basis of of these reflections at the beginning. So uh, ideally, we would like to continue the work uh, uh, that started with the survey by developing a report for our member countries that start with this uh, piece of uh, information that most of them hopefully will know already, but unfortunately not all of them know, that is uh, talk to your ombudsman institution, read their reports when you want to do policy making um, and reforms, because there you have a lot of the demands from citizens. But that's the one thing I wanted to stress that is part of the, of the reason why we are so happy to work with you. On the other hand, looking at you, we would like to convince you uh, even more uh, on, uh, on, on what, uh, uh, how important you are in the field of uh, public sector reform and open government. Um, on the one hand, uh, because uh, uh, while I, I agree with you that uh, uh, your autonomy is your strength and the weapon, as it was nicely put, uh, I would welcome if uh, uh, countries included the strengthening of your institution or of your mandate as one of their commitments in terms of open government agendas. That doesn't impinge on your autonomy, but uh, commits them to give you more resources or perhaps to extend your mandate more clearly to work on open government issues. So, of course, this might not, I don't know, this is parliament or the executive in your own country, but from our perspective, we look at this in an aggregate manner. We want to adver advocate on your behalf uh, so that you become part of the national open government agendas in terms of being a key institution that needs to be strengthened if the country is serious about transparency, accountability, and citizen participation. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to um, highlight. Um, in general, uh, it is true, and hopefully this is changing, but it is true that the role of ombudsman institution in many countries is not as uh, well known as it should be. Of course, in countries where this is being, you know, institutions have been there since uh, centuries, uh, of course, this is more well known. In other countries, the institutions are new, and both citizens and uh, the executives sometimes don't really know that. Uh, that you exist and, and, and how much helpful you can be for them. So the way we, our small contribution to this, we would like to create a collection of good practices because we believe that nothing more than practices can explain uh, what you do and why it is important that uh, citizens look at you, work with you, and the same for executives. So our medium-term goal as the OCD is that we would like to collect examples of your work, especially in the area of, of open government, so that this can be used uh, in, in, in our context, but possibly beyond also in your own country uh, uh, to, to um, better explain what you do and to perhaps receive even more uh, citizens' demands and complaints. Sometimes when we say that, ombudsman institutions tend to be shy and say that we already receive a lot and, uh, and, uh, and we are kind of working at maximum capacity, but that's also an important information that we would like to convey to the executives so that maybe they do something about, about that. And, uh, and to conclude, um, this is preliminary findings, as Elena uh, correctly pointed out. Um, we still lack the replies from Latin America. And I want to stress that they are coming, so in the new version they will be included, but I think they will change a little bit the, the picture that we have seen today. Because in that part of the world, uh, as you know better than I do, your colleagues do a lot of engagement and I think are addressing the issue of uh, keeping their autonomy while discussing with the executive and citizens in ways that might be inspiring for you. So stay tuned, we will update the, 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 out, the, the, the results of the survey and we'll share them with you in an open data format uh, as soon as we can finalize this process. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. So we look forward to that. Let's take a final question from uh, the lady here. Just keep your hand up, please. Thank you. My name is Laura Vidovic. I'm Croatian Ombudswoman. And I just wanted to share an example when you mentioned migrants and how voiceless they are. And I'm sure, as you already know, this is one of my favorite issues and, and topics that we work in the office. 
Um, and it's actually not encouraging an optimistic example. Um, rather, it's the one of frustration um, because um, Croatia is a transit country. So many of the times, most often, people don't stay long enough to see the results right. of our work and they don't send complaints. Why should they? They just want to leave as soon as possible. Um, the example I actually wanted to share is the one that we had a month ago when having an international conference to mark the 25th anniversary of our office. And we wanted to include a migrant choir that, of the people that live in Zagreb that you know engage in, in singing and they did not want to take part they said they're frustrated, they're angry at us, and not only at us in Croatia, in my office, so this is the message to all of us, I guess, here, they're angry at all of human rights and ombudsmen and whatever institutions because they feel that we didn't do enough for them. So I, I take that very seriously, even though it's very frustrating to do what needs to be done. It's very difficult to know, actually, what needs to be done because they don't send complaints, they don't tell you, you we have to learn otherwise. And it's not just the case with migrants, just echoing what Peter said earlier, giving voice to those that are voiceless in our societies are mostly impoverished. Those living in far off rural areas, maybe even illiterate. And we can't wait for the complaints to come. We need to go to those people, we need to talk to them. We need to, to visit their, them in their homes sometimes. We need to find them. And that outreach is very difficult. It's expensive. It takes creativity. And then giving them voice in talking to their mayors and to the NGOs and to the centers of mm -hmm. social welfare where they live and then to the governments on, on central level as well to see how policies can be better so that they actually can have some, some use of all of that. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I've got two people coming in. I, I see you, but just very quickly, and then I'll come to you, sir. Very short. My name is Günter Kreuter. I am the Austrian Ombudsman. And I just uh, want to add how to protect and promote human rights of refugees. I think we have to use all our instruments. That means own initiative investigations, the national preventive mandate, if it's possible, uh, cooperation with civil society, collaboration with the media, whatever we have to use. Thank you. Uh, gentleman over there, please keep your hand up. Yeah, microphone. I am Fernando Garcia Vicente, I am the Justicia Aragon. I am going to speak in Spanish. Okay. Go ahead. Soy, además de Justicia Aragón, he sido durante veintitantos años, veinticuatro años he sido, he sido fiscal. Y me preocupa extraordinariamente el problema que plantea la comparecencia de las personas ante la policía para declarar o cuando son detenidos. El derecho a la transparencia y la conexión con el derecho a la privacidad y a la presunción de inocencia se manifiestan muchas veces de una forma muy distinta. También me preocupa el derecho a la publicidad y a la transparencia que hay en los procedimientos judiciales cuando entran en colisión con el derecho que tiene una persona a, a que se respete su privacidad, su intimidad. La jurisprudencia europea es muy severa en esto y protege los derechos de los ciudadanos frente a la, ese derecho a la publicidad o esa transparencia a la administración. Y hay sentencias de los tribunales del Tribunal de Estrasburgo que establecen que no se puede firmar a una persona cuando va a declarar o cuando sale a declarar, incluso cuando ha sido declarada culpable. Sin embargo, yo tengo la impresión que, al menos en mi país, eso no se está respetando. Me parece que es un tema muy interesante y me permito, quizá desborda el tema que hoy estamos tratando, pero me permito sugerirle a la defensora del pueblo europeo que en una próxima reunión se plantee este tema porque creo que es un tema que a mucha gente le preocupa mucho. Nada más, muchas gracias. Gracias. So, a uh, final uh, word to all of you. So, uh, and I'll ask Emily to wrap up. Elena, do you want to come in at any point now? Or do you want to come in? Okay, so Peter, let's kick off with you. Yeah. 
Um, I want to particularly respond to the comments of our colleague from the OECD. Um, Firstly, uh, partly reassurance. I, I know of very few ombudsman offices who do not make the effort to influence policy and legislation and who aren't engaged in that process because of necessity. We see through our daily work the instances where the existing legislation is not doing what it should be doing, is discriminatory or whatever the case might be. And we're all, I think, content to make recommendations for changes to practice, yes, but also for changes to legislation. Now, I know some colleagues have a more formal role in respect of the creation of legislation, but it does seem to me that that's something most of us do and should continue to do. If it's not working, it's our job to tell government to fix it. Now that, but the other point I particularly wanted to pick up is this notion that the OECD would promote the recognition of ombudsman offices and properly independent ombudsman offices as part of the accountability mechanism which any government committed to open government should have. Now the IOI has been very keen to see that the ombudsman office should be recognized in the same way that NHRIs have been recognized. Um, we've been doing work with that um, recently, Catherine and has been doing some work in Europe on it. We're doing some work also, um, intending some work with the United Nations. We want to see the formal recognition of the Ombudsman Institution as a fundamental part of the accountability in every democratic country. And as a consequence, we're very pleased that you should um, be wanting to join us in that work and we look forward to working closely with you on it. And just as a final remark, um, the IOI has recently published on its website um, a document setting out how to create an ombudsman institution that will comply with all current best practice or how to amend the legislation of an existing institution to bring it in compliance with best practice. And I think you might find that of assistance when you start to shape your thoughts on the next phase of the research. Thank you. Uh, Mark, do you want to come in? Uh, I think we, we do need to finish rather quickly, so okay. please, everyone be brief. Uh, la première chose, pour aller dans le sens, effectivement, il y a actuellement une démarche qui est entreprise et au niveau de l'IOI, au niveau uh, des réseaux des médiateurs francophones, des réseaux des médiateurs de la Méditerranée, avec les institutions du Conseil de l'Europe, et c'est quand même important de, de le souligner, euh, la, la volonté est très clairement prise et par la, la commission de Venise que plusieurs d'entre nous connaissent, par l'Assemblée parlementaire et on espère par le comité des ministres, effectivement de aujourd'hui refaire le point exact avec tout le poids que la commission de Venise peut donner aux, aux, aux documents euh, qu'ils produisent sur la... la la situation aujourd'hui, la nouvelle situation des ombudsmans. Donc c'est un moment important et je pense que dans les mois qui viennent, ce document sortira et, et j'espère qu'il pourra renforcer les institutions qui sont en difficulté, mais aussi ouvrir de nouvelles perspectives pour les institutions et inciter les, les organes politiques des États concernés à avoir cette réflexion sur l'institution de l'ombudsman. Ça, c'est un. La deuxième chose, je suis aussi très sensible à la question des réfugiés. Comme vous le savez, voici maintenant quelques mois, nous avions à Tirana, nous avions organisé une réunion avec l'IOI, l'AOMF et, et, et l'AOM. La, et, et nous avons adopté une très belle résolution. Mais comme toujours, ces résolutions, c'est un peu mon leitmotiv. Nous en sommes très heureux quand nous les avons adoptées. Mais euh, quand il s'agit de faire le suivi, on se dit mais qu'est-ce que j'ai fait concrètement pour que cette résolution euh, soit, euh, devienne réalité Est-ce que j'ai pris des contacts avec, le, avec mon Parlement, avec mon gouvernement Est-ce que moi-même, j'ai essayé de travailler en réseau Et je sais que ça se fait. Les Espagnols, les Albanais, les Macédoniens travaillent concrètement euh, dans, dans des camps de, de réfugiés avec les, les amis grecs, etc. Qu'est-ce que nous faisons concrètement Ça, c'est aussi un appel que je lance. Nous sommes souvent très imaginatifs pour avoir des documents extraordinaires. Nous devons aussi prendre la même initiative pour transformer ces belles résolutions en réalité. Et je pense que le, le dossier de, de, de la crise migratoire est vraiment le plus bel exemple sur lequel nous devons agir et pas se satisfaire, je ne dis pas que nous le faisons, mais ne pas se satisfaire uniquement d'avoir écrit un document politique ou un document 
euh, interpellant pour nos autorités. Voilà, la troisième chose, et puis ce sera ma conclusion, j'espère vraiment que on trouvera les moyens d'amplifier, de, 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 d'analyser et de développer tout le travail qui a été fait. Et je pense que la Fédération ibéro-américaine des, des Ombudsman sera un partenaire tout indiqué pour pouvoir travailler sur tous ces médiateurs qui, effectivement, ont des compétences très intéressantes pour le travail que nous sommes en train de faire euh, ici. Voilà, je vous remercie. Merci beaucoup, Marc. Uh, um Yes, Emily, but uh, just before you take the floor, Emily, Elena, do you want to say something very quickly? Because I'll, and then I'll give you the floor. Um, yes, um, I just wanted to add something um, to what Alessandro just said and then reflecting on what you said. Uh, really, I think it's um, the, the motto of the OECD is better policies for better lives. So I think um, we're also really talking about the quality of the policies. Uh, so you have an incredible position in society to really feel and see what the issues are among the populations. And, and good, polit good policies are the ones that actually make a difference in the lives of people. So how do we know if these policies are good or bad? Because we know that they are responding to certain needs and certain issues that are sometimes not evident or not studied enough or where there is not enough data. So I think, I think you have a very important role in promoting quality of policies and also to promote um, better collection of data because I think yeah. this is also another important issue. If you feel that some uh, trends or some uh, urgencies are coming out from your complaints, I think you should also sensitize and target national institutions for statistics because they also need to look into those issues. Thank, Thank you. you. Emily, please. Well, just first of all, in relation to uh, the, the, the comments uh, there uh, in the OECD, I mean, I think one of the, the valuable things that this has done is that we have raised our visibility to you. Uh, and equally, in return, you have shown us uh, a way of how uh, we can develop, perhaps along paths that, that many of us may not have, may not have, have thought about. And I, I think this gives really uh, uh, a lot of us a, lo a lot of uh, food for thought. But I was quite struck, obviously, by what Laura, our colleague from Croatia, said, and I'm very conscious <coughs> of the very direct, uh, essentially humanitarian work that you have been doing, and, and our, our colleagues in Greece and Spain and others, work that many of us don't have to do because we are not directly confronted yeah. with those very, very human situations. And I can sense your frustration, and what you say is also humbling for, for all of us. I think some of us, perhaps, um, are overwhelmed by the politics of it, whether it's the geopolitics of it or anything else. We see the EU wrestling with issues in relation to Poland, Hungary, other countries. Do they sanction? Do they not? The fact that many countries have not taken any refugees, the fact that there has been a, an inappropriate burden placed on some which are not best placed to, to deal with these. And then we wonder what can we as ombudsmen do? Obviously, on, on the ground, you can do you know, very immediate and direct things sometimes. Others, the people are gone. They think you're useless, we're useless, and, and they move on, and, and perhaps perhaps rightly so. I suppose the, the, the small piece that we in, in my office have been trying to contribute with, with you has been the parallel investigations. We did one with, I think, many of the, of the colleagues in relation to the way people are returned to third countries when they've been refused um, uh, asylum, uh, how they're treated on, on the planes. You know, the, the restraints, how women and children, how sick people, how pregnant women are treated. That was a very concrete piece. I suppose I live by the idea that only do what only you can do. So I always look to see what the Office of European Ombudsman can help with. And even though it's very tempting sometimes to get involved in all sorts of issues, if I can't have a concrete outcome that there is no point, am I actually going to end up disappointing people who think that I can deliver much more than I can do? Another area related to that we're beginning to look at at the moment, and again, I deal only with European institutions, the EU institutions, relates to the European Asylum Support Office, and we're looking at the work they're doing, particularly in relation to the EU-Turkey deal. For example, the, the interviews that people have when people, perhaps, when decisions are being made as to whether they should be sent back to Turkey or not. Again, my mandate is limited, yet I firmly believe that all of us working together the member states doing your piece and I doing my piece from the EU, that that is a very, very concrete and potentially powerful way that we can, that we can work together. 
Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I, I've, I have to say, listening to all of you and, and, and seeing the first uh, results, it's really been a fascinating and for me, a steep learning curve of the challenges all of you face and the, and the work that you are doing and not just here in Europe, uh, but beyond as well. So I'm really grateful for all of your comments and remarks. Please join me in thanking this panel and thanking Elena as well. And then I have an announcement to make is that we're going to have a coffee break first and then I would like you to come back here around 11.15, 11.20 for the group photo. So let's thank our panelists and let's thank the OECD as well. <laughs>